chapter 10, verse 1, And he left there and went to the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up in order to test him and asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying hands on them. So let's talk about the patriarchal Jewish culture of the first century and beyond. Well beyond. In fact, you know, what you will find in the Talmud would shock you and Josephus and the apocryphal writings. Whereas the Hebrew scriptures are very egalitarian concerning women compared to, you know, ancient Near Eastern culture, and especially in the Gospels and Epistles, you know, meaning it recognized the inherent humanity of women in a world where women were considered property, as were children. Genesis 2 and 3 in the Eden account recognized that in the beginning, woman was created to be man's equal partner but that the consequence of the fall would be that he would rule over here, her. Excuse me. Nowhere is a man commanded to rule over her. The text clearly states that it is a consequence of their knowing good and evil, a.k.a. being to decide for themselves what is right and wrong. At the end of Genesis 3, we see the first fractured relationship between husband and wife, and in Genesis 4, between brothers. In the tale of Lamech, we see the beginnings of polygyny, um, which is a man taking more than one wife, clan warfare and feuding, but it all started with the rupture of the first and primary relationship of husband and wife. Um, human relationship, obviously. Um, they were no longer allies, but trapped in a cycle of longing and conflict. She would naturally long for life as it was with intact familiar relationships, and she would never have it. And he would exert dominance over her. Uh, no wonder with such strife that things went so haywire in the very next generation. Now, I've taught this previously, but we're going to come at it via a slightly different an angle because it reads differently in Matthew. The writer of Matthew was concerned with Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, as the ultimate teacher uh, slash interpreter of law interpreter of Israel, the new and greater Moses, whereas the Gospel of Mark is concerned with Yeshua as the Yahweh warrior, fighting against the dominion of the enemy, and what was the very first thing the enemy successfully attacked? Um, the man and the woman, through appealing to their desire to decide for themselves what was right or wrong, and that will enter heavily into this week's controversy dialogue. Oh, there's a word we have heard a lot sir, since the beginning of, uh, what, <sighs> Mark chapters 2 and 3 with the controversy dialogues. Um, hello, uh, I am Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of scripture with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah. If you prefer written material, I have five years worth of blog at theancientbridge.com, as well as my six books available on Amazon. 
including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural in a context that in a way that even kids can understand it called Context for Kids. And I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. You can find the links for those uh, channels on my website. Past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com and transcripts can be had for most broadcasts at theancientbridge.com. If you have kids, I have a weekly broadcast now where I teach them Bible context in a way that shows them why they can trust God and how he wants to have a relationship with them through the Messiah, and that's Context for Kids. All scripture this week comes courtesy of the ESV, the English Standard Version, but you can follow along with whatever Bible you want. A list of my resources can be found attached to the transcript for part two of this series at theancientbridge.com. All right, let's start out. So remember last week we jumped forward and we covered the third passion prediction plus the other two. We just looked at them as a whole because it was the Passover. So if you're hearing this, when it first airs, this is the week of unleavened bread. And this is a weird week of unleavened bread because when the Sabbath fell, um, first fruits uh is like a full week after the passover so that's that's kind of weird but uh anyway it's all good let's start with uh chapter 10 and he left there and went to the region of judea and beyond jordan and crowds gathered to him again and again as was his custom he taught them so this is interesting no one really knows for sure how long of a time period went by between the transfiguration at the beginning of chapter 9 and here at the beginning of chapter 10. Was the transfiguration near Sukkot? Was that the um, reference, the reason for the reference to setting up of tabernacles for Moses and Elijah? It's a popular idea in some circles, but I'm not really buying it. I think there is this natural tendency to want to make the Gospels more Jewish, which is unnecessary because they're totally Jewish. Um, you know, ask any Jewish scholar and they will tell you that the Gospels and epistles are all sectarian Jewish writings. I, um, I think that in order, in an attempt to really hammer home the fact that Yeshua is Jewish, people just grasp at any straw. But when we focus on trying to do that, we often miss what's actually there. You know, classic example is how no one in the Hebrew roots or Messianic Jewish circles actually seem to want to talk about anything in Mark 7 except for what is the definition of food. And I get it. I've been there. But it's not what Yeshua was even talking about. We miss that when we come in with an agenda from the outside um, of trying to prove Yeshua is Jewish. You go through the genealogies, <laughs> Mark chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, it's like, okay, he's Jewish, okay? <laughs> there you go. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, regardless of when, it's late winter, um, early spring now. Okay, when, when he's, when he's talking about this. And um, Yeshua was probably holed up somewhere for the winter months, teaching his disciples as time was running out and they needed to understand. So now they ventured south. Last week we had them in Jericho healing the blind man and they will not return to Galilee until after the resurrection. We're going to be really heavy on the controversy dialogues, a second set for a lot of weeks here. And before we go there, I want to say this. This is a touchy subject for a lot of folks. I'm not going to go into the nightmare stories of what does and does not justify divorce. Yeshua is going to do here what he does and what he needed to do, which is bring people back to God's purposes and intentions and away from the very wicked mindset that plagued those times and even our times. All right. Not what we feel is justified sometimes or what we can get away with, which is what the Pharisees are doing. But what does God want? What did he want in the beginning? How does the kingdom of heaven work when we're all living in harmony with it? All right. 
So no defensiveness. We should be able to talk about this without people taking sides and saying, but, but, okay. This is like my fourth major teaching on this. I even wrote a chapter on it in my book, Sexuality, Social Identity, and Kinship Relations in the Bible. I don't feel that it is the unforgivable sin, and I don't see anywhere that God feels that way either. But the situation Yeshua is addressing here is incredibly wicked by anyone's standards, and we need to focus on that. So if you've been divorced, just put that out of your mind right now, and let's see what Yeshua is saying. All right? He deserves that. Verse 2, And the Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? You know what it actually sounds like when I say that? It's like, did God really say you couldn't eat? <laughs> anyway, um, but it seems like a straightforward question, right? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? But no. This is not only a trap, but a potentially deadly one. Remember where we are. We're beyond the Jordan. Who rules this area? Herod Antipas. Why was John the Baptist beheaded? Because he made Herod Antipas' sister-in-law slash wife angry by preaching against their incestuous and adulterous marriage. She unilaterally divorced her husband, Herod Philip, not the one who ruled in the north. There were, everybody was named Herod and there were lots of Philips all over the place. And, and married his half-brother after becoming enamored of him during a visit to Rome, which is actually why she divorced her husband. Unilateral divorces weren't all that shocking, of course, as long as the man initiated it. But this was a woman, and this was also incest. Ew. In more ways than one, her being the half-cousin of both husbands. <laughs> anyway, no one was happy about the murder of John the Baptist. He was universally loved and um, considered to be a righteous man, according to Josephus. But they had to be hoping that they could get rid of Yeshua via the same controversy. And yet, this is more nuanced than the situation with Herod Antipas and his sister-in-law slash wife. The Hillelite Pharisees were practicing a terrible form of oppression against their wives, and this was one of their main points of contention with the Shammaite Pharisees. As we see in Tractate Gittin, this was their practice to divorce, it was their practice to divorce their wife for any reason whatsoever. Over a burnt meal, and Akiva even said if they found someone prettier, which, you know, spelled doom for every woman whereas the law only gave them permission if the wife was found guilty of indecency permission, the Hillelites could maintain a tyrannical form of control over their wives who had better not be displeasing or they would be out on the street. In a time and culture where the women were unemployable and uneducated, this could result in financial ruin, starvation, and always dishonored the woman. Plus, and this will sound strange to anyone from my generation. The children were the legal property, not of the wife, but of the husband. She loses everything in one fell swoop. She is even given her ketubah money agreed to, you know, in the marriage contract, unless she's actually guilty of um, adultery, and she has to go. So she's given her money, she's told to go sometimes without warning. But this was a patriarchal society where marriage and feelings toward women did not show any signs of being influenced by the Torah. The Pharisees were the kings of the loophole, and this was one of the areas where the Essenes, or the Qumran sect, really raked them over the coals for divorce and for polygyny. Uh, polygyny taking more than one wife. They were criticized for not for being not only obsessed with wealth, but also pleasure seekers. Yeshua is going to tackle both of these, divorce and polygyny, if we know what to look for. And I'm going to point out something. Questions about divorce are always traps. No one asks this question seeking information. They're always ready to spring if you don't give them the answer they want to hear. Ask me how I know. 
But these guys are asking, is it lawful? And here's the problem with the question as phrased. It's asking about legal precedence. Do men have the right to divorce their wives? But Yeshua is going to bring it back to Genesis 2 and Leviticus 19.18, where all questions about marriage should find their roots. This is always a question about legitimacy and not legal grounds. People want to hear that they're justified. Verse 3, he answered them, What did Moses command you? Notice the question. What did Modus, Moses command you? And it's a trick question because there is no commandment to divorce. It's neither a positive or negative commandment. As opposed to, say, the incest laws or sacrificial or dietary laws, there's no thou shalt divorce your wife if. And they know it. You can tell by their response, which is defensive. By phrasing the question the way he did, Yeshua puts them as the ones needing to defend themselves. Verse 4. They say, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. You can almost hear them. Moses let us do it. He said we could, you know, write her again and send her packing. And I'm sure they were genuine in their interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sets her out of the house, and she departs out of the house, etc., etc. But, you know, um, a man who is justified because his wife has truly been indecent isn't going to be engaging in public questions and debates. He's going to just either forgive and keep her or say good riddance. But they know they're trapped. There is no commandment here and they know it. They say allowed. An allowance, of course, is an escape hatch out of a bad situation. An allowance recognizes that things are not as they should be for whatever reason. Verse 5. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. And boom. Ugh. Notice that Yeshua makes no claims that this commandment came from God's heart toward his people. Yeshua specifically says that Moses wrote it. Let's go back and read it again just to be very clear on it. Because of your hardness of heart, he, referring back to Moses, wrote you this commandment. And the next verse says, in effect, but God... So they're really in a bad spot now. In the best of situations, divorce is allowed because of hardness of heart. And what does that even mean in this case? Hardness of heart in the case of indecency in marriage boils down to two things. Betrayal on one side and unforgiveness on the other. Of course, you know, what I have not mentioned here is that male unfaithfulness wasn't considered adultery, but a crime against another man's property rights. Either spouse, betrothed, or father. Women during this era were not considered to be or treated as fully human with rights to consider their husbands to be cheating skunks if they visited prostitutes or took a second wife. But men would consider themselves wronged in the extreme if their wives stepped out. And of course, taking a second husband was unthinkable. The Essenes rightly took the Hillelites to task over this, and Yeshua does it here as well. Um... Verse 6, 7, and 8. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
Now, according to Yeshua and other strict scriptures, who wrote the Torah? Moses did. The Torah is even called Moses in shorthand, like according to Moses, such and such. And so it could be argued that this was written by Moses and this was therefore the actual command of Moses because it is lifted from Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24 with a slight bit of commentary thrown in. From the beginning, meaning God's perfect intention and created state in the beginning before the fall, God made humans male and female. That's Genesis 1. Genesis 2 goes right after Adam has his epiphany about Eve not being like one of the animals to be named and have dominion exercised over, but at the same bone and flesh, the Ezer Konegdo, an equal helper, an ally, a counterpart. And it is odd. The way it's stated, because in Hebrew culture, a woman joined the man's family. He never left his family. And the wife really had no standing until the birth of their first son. She was always lesser in status to his mother and unmarried sisters within the family, and that never changed. Really, a wife gained her status through her male children, and it was among them that she found companionship and loyalty. Marriage in biblical times was what it was. A mess. It was not what God intended with a man leaving the family of his birth emotionally and cleaving to his wife. In effect, he would cleave to her sexually to produce heirs and for pleasure, but man and wife were rarely much more than strangers in the ancient world. They were one flesh sexually, but otherwise the man's loyalties remained with his mother and father. Remember, the Bible records how things were, but not how they were intended to be all the time. Marriage was and is a fallen relationship, as was is parenting as we see in Genesis 3 and 4. But Yeshua says that God demands a higher standard amongst his people. Men and, men and women um, cleave to one another in relationship of absolute love, vulnerability, and trust. They become true allies, equals, and partners one another's, you know, as their connecto, and in that case, indecency and divorce and such would become unthinkable. And Yeshua speaks of here of two becoming one flesh, not three or four or five. There was no harem in the garden. That was not the righteous intention or command. Lamech was the first polygynist having two wives, but he was also the first recorded person to vow vengeance on anyone who would lay a finger on him. I've been teaching Genesis to the kids on my radio show and in my studies right now to Genesis 4. One of the scholars I'm reading made a good point. Torah doesn't outright outlaw polygamy, but the polygamous families portrayed are never happy or without severe drama, and it's always associated with problems. Again, hardness of heart issue. Look at the fruit in scripture. I want to give you a blurb from um, the Babylonian Talmud um, Yevamot 63b that talks about how they felt it was best to deal with a displeasing wife. Rabbah further stated, a bad wife, the amount of whose ketubah is large, should be given a rival at her side, as people say, by her partner rather than by a thorn. So punish a wife who displeases you, whom you cannot afford to divorce, or don't want to part with her large contracted payment if you do divorce her. So punish her with a second wife. It's disgusting. Like, you know, the problem is automatically her. Certainly, it couldn't be that a guy with that attitude would be the problem. It's heartless. It's the epitome of being hard-hearted. He's an adulterer for doing it. Oh, jeez. And, I mean, it's shocking nowadays, but it was really vile. It was really vile in the first century and for a long time afterward. Be right back. Hey, 
this is Tyler Don Rosenhost, and welcome back to the second half of this week's Character in Context, which I gave the very uh, <laughs> unflattering name, Dismantling Oppression, Let Not Man Separate. Because we are talking about a very real form of oppression in the ancient world, and that was the ability, um, one, for a man to unilaterally divorce his wife, um, for any reason whatsoever, according to the Hellalite Pharisees, who unfortunately were the prevailing opinion in first century Judaism, because frankly, when men are told that if they find someone prettier, they can feel free to divorce their wives, you know, in a culture like that, when they didn't even really consider women to be human beings, um, they're going to follow their nether regions and, um, Go ahead and do that a lot of times. And uh, we also just talked about the fact that um, adultery was only considered to be a crime that a woman could commit against her husband. When a man um, had sexual relations with a woman who wasn't his wife, it was considered a crime against either her father, um, her betrothed, or um, her husband. It wasn't considered a crime against his wife, and it that's ridiculous, but that's the way that they were looking at it in the first century within Judaism, and for a long time afterward, and for a long time before, if you look at the extra-biblical writings, uh, like Sirach, and, and, and then afterwards in like the Talmud, this was, this was not just winked at, this was endorsed. So, yeah, not pretty horrifying. So, um, chapter 10, verse 9, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And of course, Yeshua had just quoted from Genesis 1 and 2 um, with the attitude that men were supposed to take into marriage, but were not. Um, so make no mistake, Yeshua just told these guys that man is not the Lord of the marriage, where he can come and go as he pleases. God is the Lord of the marriage, and man has no right to wrong his wife and call it good based on a technicality of how they read Deuteronomy 24. Yeshua is flat out telling them that their focus is upside down. It isn't can I divorce my wife, or do I have the right to divorce my wife? It's, what are we getting wrong that we're even thinking about this, and especially under our any-cause divorce rules? In Matthew, while talking about divorce, they flat out say that if a man can't unilaterally divorce his wife, then it's better not to get married. That's what the disciples said. All right? <laughs> yeah. Speaking as a representative for womankind throughout the centuries, if that's their attitude, then we are better off without them. <laughs> you see, they saw marriage as an institution existing for the benefit and purposes of the man. And when the man saw something that he thought of as more beneficial, even for purely sexual reasons like finding someone prettier or taking a second wife... They popped the escape hatch and never gave their wives a backward glance. Now, Tractate Gittin, dealing with um, divorces, is just brutal. Women have no recourse. Divorce could come without warning, and their fates were subjected to the husband's whims. But he is laying the divorce squarely on their own heads and calling them transgressors, which they were. It was horribly oppressive. A happily married woman, or so she assumed, could lose her husband in an hour and her children and everything. If she failed to find another husband for before her ketubah money ran out, then she would be destitute. And we ladies all know that there is always someone younger and prettier on the horizon. Marriage is an act of absolute trust. Yeshua is stating that God has joined them with their wives and they should be loath to divorce them. It is a last resort when the marriage covenant is shattered and not a matter of convenience. In effect, here we have the bottom line. 
If the marriage is holy, meaning no adultery, no destruction of the covenant by either partner, no indecency, no actual abuse, then divorce is unsanctioned by God. Verse 10, And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. matter. Now, we've talked about this before. When you respect someone, you never ask them questions in public for fear of shaming them and causing them to lose face. This is honor, shame, society rules. Matthew, as I mentioned before, gives the details of their shameful objection, you know, slash question. But Mark is more concerned with restoring Eden and the second exodus that is underway out of sin and death. And this was a huge sin issue during those days and for a long time afterward. But the congregations of Messiah adopted a no divorce, no unfaithfulness, no betrayal attitude that set them apart not only from the Hillelite Pharisees and, by extension, most of the Jews during that time because, you know, people look for excuses to do what they want and they rarely go with the rulings that deny them a hot new young chick. But also the larger Greco-Roman world they'd be at odds with. I mean, if you read works like Sirach, you know, Ecclesiasticus, um, it's the other name for it, and Josephus and the Talmud, it doesn't speak kindly of women or in any sort of egalitarian manner with the exception of Beruria. They were property. So were, you know, so were children. Men didn't experience loss. That was for lesser beings like women and children. So, you know, look at Yeshua on the other hand. You know, he had women followers. Women could sit at his feet and learn from him. The first witnesses to the resurrection were women. 20% of those named by Paul as leaders in the early church were women, including apostles, teachers, prophets, and deacons. Women were expected to prophesy and contribute in the early congregations. They were benefactors, etc., etc. Unheard of in the ancient world. Well, not the benefaction thing. That was, that was well known. Now, although, you know, we do catch glimpses of it, you know, in Miriam, Deborah, Yael, and Huldah, so the Hebrew scriptures were not being faithfully brought into the first century. Verse 11, and he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. I call this, thou shalt not have the upper hand commandment, all right? This was shocking as I alluded to before. Men in honor-shame societies were expected to be aggressive, physically, verbally, politically, professionally, and sexually. If you asked a man of that era, or even up until modern times in the Western world, it was expected for a man to behave in a manly fashion, and manly meant everything that Yeshua stood against. Revenge, domination, the lording of authority, ambition, sexual promiscuity, etc., getting honor slash reputation at all costs, no matter who pays the price. They didn't hear this the way we read it now because we live in a culture where, duh, of course it's adultery when a man cheats on his wife, but as I mentioned before, in that world you weren't sinning against your wife by cheating or taking another wife through frivolous divorce and remarriage in their mindset, okay? You were, however, sinning against the man who was her husband, betrothed her father. This woman belonged to someone. She had no rights to expect faithfulness from her husband. Do you think that David's wives were thrilled that he kept marrying more women? Leah and Rachel's relationship as sisters were sh was shattered. There were accusations between them, according to scripture. Leah accused Rachel of taking her husband. Rachel wanted sons in order to triumph over her sister. Neither one had any say in Laban's or Jacob's plans. No one cared what they thought. But here, Yeshua says that if a man divorces his wife and takes another, another wife, he's actually guilty of something he didn't think he could possibly even be guilty of. After all, he wasn't violating another man's property. He observed all the legalities. She came home one day to a get, a divorce decree, and, or one was delivered to her along with her money and orders to vacate the premises immediately and leave her children behind. In the eyes of these Pharisees, all the legalities were observed, and so Yahweh had to give his stamp of approval. 
I call it the difference between being a moralist and a legalist. Any child of an alcoholic who would look down on a cocaine or marijuana user can relate to this. Oh wait, you guys mostly don't live in Idaho. It's still illegal here, marijuana, so stick with me, okay? Now you can be an alcoholic and feel good about yourself because you aren't breaking the law. But people who use illegal drugs are criminals. And so you are better than they are. Even though you are just as impaired and damaging your kids just as much. I mean, if your kid needs to go to the hospital and they can't depend on you because you're high, it doesn't matter to them if it's because of booze, weed, or coke. But to a legalist, it matters. Legal is okay no matter how messed up the conclusions are. Like here with the any cause, Hillelite divorces. But Yeshua says the man who does this is sinning against his wife, not against another man. This was revolutionary. Yeshua has, in effect, legally elevated the wronged wife to the status of any other man. Verse 12. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And of course, because Yeshua always presents women and men on equal footing, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. But there is more here because he's actually broaching the possibility that a woman can even do this. During this era, only rich and powerful women like Herodias could do something so scandalous. They would need to be independently wealthy. Although the Pharisees did have a loophole, a woman was permitted to make her husband miserable in order to secure his divorcing her. I doubt it happened often, unless a woman had other prospects, or unless she was already really, really miserable. Very few women would be stupid enough to do this if the husband wasn't violent. Again, the brokenness here is heartbreaking. Yeshua is egalitarian, but he doesn't favor women over men. He favors the oppressed and vulnerable over those who oppress and are in charge. In this case, the men had all the power. I wonder what he would say today. How much would be the same and how much would be different if he told this to us? Now, I want to add one more thing. What was the purpose of the get, the divorce decree? It served the purpose of allowing the woman to marry again. According to Josephus in Antiquities 15, 529, women were being forbidden to remarry unless they not only had the divorce decree, but also their ex-husband's permission. So he, if he's like, well, I don't want her, but I don't want anyone else to have her either, then she's stuck for life. In the ancient world, Men often had that kind of absolute ownership over women for life. The get allowed by Moses was proof positive that she was divorced and eligible to take another husband. So she would not be accused of having two husbands at the same time. He couldn't come back and say, whoa there, I don't know what she told you, but this is my wife and you've wronged me. It could be very dangerous. Could result not only in the woman's death, but also clan warfare again hard-heartedness. Verse 13, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. Oh, thank goodness. And change the subject. That was really unpleasant. So let's talk about children whose legal status was dwarfed even by that of women. <laughs> women had it good compared to children, okay? And I need to point out that if the disciples were the age most scholars seem to think they are, they were barely what we would call adults anyway. You know, so anyway, as though Yeshua had never taught them before about their ambition problems and their super secret cool kid club mentality and whoever exalts himself will be humbled and all that jazz. Here they are abusing their supposed authority again. Children, you know, by the definition, were the least of these, you know, until... Just recently, historically, they're being rebuked and shooed away as though they are beneath Yeshua's notice. But again, the disciples will find themselves publicly rebuked in front of those children and their parents. Oh boy. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. 
do not hinder them. This is the same language we saw with their hindering, you know, being stumbling blocks to that exorcist. They were flat out told that hindering people, if they did it, you know, it would be better to have a, a large millstone tied around their neck and dumped into the Sea of Galilee, which is super deep, by the way. They were behaving again like they are the doorkeepers to the kingdom of heaven, and if they don't allow you in for whatever reason, you do not get in. They will actually let the rich young man come right in. Next week we'll see that. They allow the Pharisees and scribes to come. They allow the synagogue leader Jairus. Who do they shoo away? The blind and the children. Oh. Reminds me of the situation in the book of James. Chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place. While you say to the poor man, oh, You stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? The ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Ow! Yeshua repeatedly warns them that those who are great in the kingdom are generally not those who are great in this life. He's forever having to deal with their ambitions and their expectations of worldly glory and authority. As they near Jerusalem, it has to be becoming more and more disheartening for him that they still don't get that his followers after the resurrection will largely be the very people the disciples are despising. <sighs> what does he say in verse 15 here? Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And I've taught about this before too. Last year when I was, I did a two-part series on um, the little children. It was two of the first things I taught actually because you got to get rid of some of the modern baggage about how children are perceived in order to understand how it would have been perceived by that audience. Because people often make this to be about needing to be innocent. But no one in the ancient world had any illusions about children being inherently innocent or sin-free or anything like that. What children do have over adults is a willingness to just accept a gift without question or suspicion. It's also why it's so easy to take advantage of kids. Offer them something and sometimes even when they've been trained to say no, they will still accept it. Um, their desire for a gift overrides their sensibilities. Now, when the disciples see the blind beggar or the child or the woman, they see someone with nothing to offer, you know, according to their idea of the kingdom. But Yeshua simply sees people who will accept it gladly, knowing they have nothing to offer. When, what the disciples see is a liability. Yeshua sees from the vantage point of his upside-down gospel. He sees people who will come in with absolute loyalty, knowing that they haven't earned it because they have nothing in that culture to earn it with. They will come in without pride, as opposed to the disciples who are still seeing their future in terms of eschatological glory. You know, yet... Also, in terms of worldly rewards of power and prestige, they don't see the reality of servanthood, persecution, deprivation, suffering, and death in the future. They still see themselves as people of prestige who are insiders with the clout to accept and exclude as per their own cultural prejudices. And Yeshua flat out warns them again. 
that unless they receive the kingdom as people who can see it as an unmerited gift, they won't be able to enter in at all. I'm not going to end up like Judas. Okay? Verse 16. Remember, he's still warning Judas. Okay? He's still warning Judas. I think he knows exactly what's going to happen, but I think he, at the same time, out of love, you keep warning, okay? Verse 16, And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as if all that rebuking wasn't bad enough, Yeshua takes the children in his arms and pays attention to them. He blesses them. He actually lays hands on them just like he would an adult and treats them like fully realized human beings. You know, Yeshua sees equal worth in all human beings. It's a theme we see in Paul. No Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, and I could add, no child or adult. Yeshua is no respecter of persons in that he sees the person and not the labels or the gender or social status. That stuff's important to us, and we kind of inflict it on the text without really reading the text and challenging ourselves on that. Now, I, I want to say something before we close out. I'm really disturbed at the propensity of people to read the hard commands of Yeshua and to go to the Torah and the prophets looking for a loophole as to why he didn't really mean what he said. Yeshua threw out this. He's been overturning a really messed up interpretation of the Torah. And that's the problem with the Torah. It isn't internal. It's external. External ordinances will always be toyed with for good or for bad to satisfy our agendas, our desires, our lusts for sex and power and wealth and, and whatever we think that we need or deserve. But Yeshua, according to, the he, according to Hebrews, is the final revelation of God. If he says something, I would rather take him too seriously than dare to proof text him. For those of you who don't know what proof texting means, it is searching the Bible for positions that will support our position while ignoring context and also ignoring the verses which don't support our position. There are times when we can look for the context of what he is saying, and that's fine. We need to do that, okay? But we should never outright negate his words just because they are hard. Sometimes we have to um, go to other places in the scripture to say, well, what is he talking about when he's saying this? Because it, you know, but that's not what I see people doing. His kingdom is not like this world, and so we should be very fearful of elevating any revelation through any mere human above his words. Okay? Anyway, so... Next week, and we allude, I, I actually kind of mentioned this already, we're going to talk about the rich young ruler who had zero issues slipping past the disciples. And uh, we're going to talk about that pesky urban legend of the camel going through the quote-unquote eye of the needle gate. And yes, it is an urban legend, and we're going to talk about that. And I might even talk about... Um, how you can figure out for yourself, you know, start thinking about, you know, you've heard something. Is it true? And, boy, we're going to do that when we talk about the triumphal entry, too, because there's a very popular urban legend in Hebrew roots and Messianic Jewish circles that neither I or my friends or anyone I've ever talked to has been able to come up with a source for. But it's one of those things that sounds good, you know. And so people say, well, wouldn't this be true? cool if it were true and they teach it and all of a sudden it's considered to be uh, the gospel truth <laughs> anyway so next week rich young ruler i will see you then